This is the second half of a presentation I started earlier, the whole Flexbox thing and so on. Really, I need to separate it out into its own stuff. If you want to see the, the slides, if you go back to that presentation where, where I initially introduced Flexbox and described it in presentation form, um, the second half of those slides are actually what I'm going through now. There isn't much time in this class for much design theory. Um, it's been touched on when we talked about color, for sure, and how we use colors and why we use colors. When we talked about type and fonts and why we use certain fonts and how we use them. Either of those things could be an entire course in itself. And then there's all the rest of the design theory. How do the different parts of our pages relate together into each other? You know, um, well, let's just take a couple minutes to think about it as you're you know, launching into your resume final and so on. This is the famous and much used crap principles of design. Contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. You can remember those and pay attention to them and ask yourself, how am I using these properly? How am I doing a good job with these things in my, in my website, in my resume, for instance? That'll be really useful. So what do I mean by these things? What do they mean visually? Contrast means things that are different are really different. Contrast could be the uh, hierarchy of heading sizes. I want to definitely see that my H1 is bigger than my H2. And they're not just close. They're definitely different. There's a contrast in size there. Also, color. If I'm making two things two different colors, I don't want them to be almost exactly the same color, just a little different. No, I want them to be different colors. Contrast. Shape of things, too. Maybe you, you like it's nice to have horizontals and verticals on the page, just as it could be if we had the example of triangles and circles. We don't have too many, but we might. So contrast and shapes. Otherwise, when things don't contrast, then they should be the same. And when they are, they are the same, that's repetition. And that's fine. That's good. Repetition brings consistency. Repeat the same kind of, for instance, when we have, maybe all your H2s look exactly the same. And that's good. They send a certain message of a certain level of category. And they're treated the same way. Maybe, maybe and one of the things that might be the same is a certain type of paragraph or a certain type of character or a certain type of heading might always have the same color. Then when I see that color, it reinforces the idea. That's that same kind of heading I saw before. So, Spacing works a similar way. The way we space things should be the same, and many times it's repetition. The fonts, for sure. You can use just one font through your entire resume, and I actually like it. Um, I don't think you need to change other fonts. Maybe there'll be a little difference for a reason. That would be contrast, contrasting fonts. Otherwise, repetition, repetition is a good thing. We train our readers, our viewers of our websites, to look for certain things and that they have a certain meaning and they get repeated. Alignment. Our eye likes it when things line up. There, these, this line up here, all aligned left, that's great. But when things are nearly aligned but not quite aligned, that's when they look odd. Odd is not necessarily bad. In fact, when we see design trends, we'll see that the idea of like little things that look almost like mistakes can also be a good thing. Um, However, as far as text alignment goes, we usually stick with one alignment. Otherwise, if you have multiple items, like they're floating and maybe absolutely positioned around a page, that won't, this won't affect your, the alignment of text affects you for sure. But alignment of other items may not affect you so much in your resume. Proximity. This is something which is hard to get across, but I really want you to think about it for your resume. Things that go together are close to each other. Things that don't go together aren't. So think about your resume. Your H2 and the paragraphs that follow it all go together. They're in the same kind of grouping. Certainly that H3 with that job and the stuff that goes with it go together. So you should, they should feel like they hang together as a group. One of the best ways to do that is to make them separate from others. In general, I would say to deal with proximity, we add white space rather than taking it away. So. I feel, I feel like these two things go together, yet it's definitely different from this thing down here. And don't be afraid of adding white space, which means space with nothing else in it, no type or images, adding space to push things apart to feel like we have groupings of things. Proximity is very powerful, um, and uh, it's something that the HTML on its own doesn't do well, so you have to work on it with the box model. And maybe with other tools too, but mostly the box model. 
So, what do you think of these sites? Nah, I'm not going to look at those sites. I have some other sites I want to look at. Um, something newer. So, this is a site I just came across. Google Arts and Culture. Hong Kong Heritage Museum. Um, already I see some amazing contrasts here. I see contrast in giant size and tiny size. I see contrast in type size to some degree. These little logos, this read more, I see contrast in color. I see contrast now in size of images and the way images are handled. I see, I see, I see alignment changes. Boom, 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 boom. These are all aligned in a certain way. Now alignment is all different inside of here. All of a sudden I've got shape contrast. I don't have a lot of hierarchy of font sizes in this page. Um, so I see a lot of contrast. I see some contrast in shapes and so on. I see colors. I see proximity. These things are all pulled together like crazy. They're definitely different from these things, which are definitely different. These things, these kind of hang together, separate, separate. And repetition, of course, I see in the repetition of these sizes and all the fonts that are used in the same ways. Repetition, repetition in fonts down here, then we're repeating this logo over again. So that's how I would think about those design principles as, as they relate to that. And you know what? I have some other sites I could show you. Mm, I'm not going to. We'll skip. We'll say, well, I'll let you think about sites that you look at and how those principles apply. And before you start, now, as far as designing a site, what we've done with your resume is you've learned design and you built and built and built and built as you went along. You've learned the HTML and CSS. So it's just kind of grown organically. Of course, that's not really how your site would begin. Um, actually, it would start before even design phase. It would start with keywords and so on. We'll talk about that another time. But one thing you definitely, when you're working in the design frame, you would do wireframing, which is essentially just sketching, either sketching on paper, and people still do this. They sketch on paper, graph paper, and map out a site, or they might cut, cut things out of magazines and use paper and other media and paste things together to what they want as far as look at, look like in general. Or they might use uh, a, a layout tool like the 90, 960GS, which I'm not teaching here, but it's getting a little old fashioned, but it's a kind of a different kind of layout prototyping tool. Or they might use something like InDesign or Photoshop and build prototypes there. They're just sort of like mock ups. Um, there's lots of wireframing resources. If you just type web wireframing, there's also programs you can use, many others. Um, that's all I want to get say about wireframing and site sketching, but they're definitely important tools you might use. And you might think about web design trends. If you use a link like this one, or just which Google's web design trends, you'll get, among others, sites like this, which talks about current trends. These are eight innovative web trends for 2020. And we definitely see some big changes in sites this year. Now, of course, there's lots of old sites around still, and they are not changing necessarily. But here are some of the trends according to these people. And there are some, some, big, some big changes. Excuse me. Sorry, some big changes. We're seeing more dark sites. Frankly, my poor old eyes don't like that. But we're definitely seeing more and more dark sites. And we're seeing, um, I think this is definitely a trend I've seen in print also. Imperfections that add personality. You know, in some ways, our lives are filled, our lives are filled with glossy, perfectly made things um, all around us. So that handmade imperfections is something interesting that we're seeing more and more on the, being simulated on the web. Of course, that's a joke, right? It's being simulated in what is almost a perfect environment. But things that are not really lined up quite right, things that are more like handwriting, things that are a bit more goofy or more like scrapbooked or more feel a bit more handmade, imperfect hand-drawn things. We're seeing more and more of that. Um, immersive 3D elements, I guess so. Um, it's an awful lot of work, it looks like to me, and not something that we can, that you're gonna be able to handle doing based on this class. But here's something interesting. For quite a while, we saw the web trend was away from shadows and away from 3D looking things. And now we're seeing that coming back again. For quite a while, we had, everything was flat design. Um, that is for like probably two years. And then this past year and a half, we've seen more and more shadow and heading more towards 3D design coming back. 
um, soft sh mixing photography with graphics. I don't think that's anything that new, but they think it's a new trend. I see maybe it's a bit more new when it's done like this. Um, and solid frames of white space. Mm, okay. I guess what that means is white space as in unused, like solid frame open areas around the edges of page, much more like traditional margins. Um, and glowing luminous color schemes. We definitely, I've definitely been hearing that that brighter and neon-y colors are coming back and uh, luminous color schemes, I guess so, that would be kind of part of that idea. Minimalist navigation. Where's the navigation? I can't even find it. Well, we're used to that navigation now on mobile, so now we're seeing it everywhere, I guess. Maybe that's part of it. And are we done here? More trends. Okay, that's enough. So, uh, but you go to 10 different sites like this and you'll get 10 different ideas, sort of, but there'll be something, a feeling that we're all headed in a certain direction, but yet it doesn't mean we all have to go the same way either. Hey, maybe you want to be a contrarians. And when you're, when you're working on sites and just do your own thing, make like go the opposite direction to look different. That's another option too. Okay. So now let's look more at the, the traditional structure of traditional pages. And the other way to look at design is break down existing sites and think about the different areas on the site and what kind of jobs they're doing and what what they're what they're the function of their design, right? And um, for instance, on on a very traditional site, we see a, a a header navigation area, we see a a main content area. We see a secondary content area, and we see a footer area. So those things are repeated and repeated and repeated all around the web. And those, those chunks have different jobs to do. The feature area, the main feature area is usually the big image. It might be a carousel of images that fly by. Um, it might be image with text on it, as in these examples. Maybe not. Maybe the text is separate. The big image. Not every site has it, but it's pretty traditional. And I think it's a good idea, a dominant art and draw the attention to the big story with the big image it's what it's images are what, what the web it's image and type what the web is all about and the big images catch our attention if they're good ones body content area or you could say secondary content area if that was the main spotlighted content area now we're typically going to get um lots of little points of entry they're called multiple points of entry lots of little areas lots of little gimmicks, lots of little images, lots of little headlines, trying to get attention, get attention, get attention. And this stuff could very well be categorized in lots of different chunks too. All right, the footer area, we haven't really talked about the header area on the top. Of course, its main job is navigation and branding. I guess I skipped that. The footer area on the bottom though, the whole footer area, and footer, area, footer areas can be sometimes very large. They can actually have all other kinds of other content in them, right, the whole footer area or they can be relatively small. They have a lot of jobs to do too, usually legalese. Maybe they sometimes they have something called breadcrumbs. Look around at sites and you'll start to see this. It's almost like a bunch of links that are like site navigation kind of. It's almost like a link map for the site in the footer. Well, why are they there? Maybe to be useful, but also for SEO. Because remember, remember that Google loves links and likes to see a really good link structure, internal link structure too. So the more and more links, maybe you'll get picked up, maybe it'll give you some enhancements with Google. Um, so breadcrumbs might see there also. Um, so there's a lot of work that these things do. Uh, that's so giant, well not giant, but an extremely quick overview of a giant topic. And uh, at least it gave us a little bit of foundation and also it'll help you on your next uh, um, take home quiz too.